That has been a tough realization. So Noah's our oldest, he's 12. And I think it's been tough for him because he's had to have those communications and those conversations with me in terms of me having to explain to him, you're gonna have to work that much harder to get the same thing as your white counterparts. And it's unfair, I think, that I have to explain that to him and I have to bring that into his radar, but that's the reality of the situation. Matt, we can learn so much by listening to people different than us, by listening to their stories, by listening to their experiences, sometimes just asking a question and just closing our mouths and listening to what they have to say. You know, right now we find ourselves in a very interesting a time, point in time in our country as it deals with the race. So uh, I know this is a topic that interests both uh, you and I. So you had the idea to bring on interracial couples to hear about their experiences, to hear about their stories as as a couple uh, dealing with just some of the race uh, tensions that are happening right now. So this is going to kick off a short series of conversations with interracial couples. So I'm really excited uh, to have Mike and Leah Stancil with us today. Mike is actually a counselor at your practice at Dr. Matt Morris and Associates. And Leah is the head swimming and diving coach at Tulane University, obviously Mike's uh, wife, and most recently a breast cancer survivor. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm gonna hand it off to you and uh, we'll see where we end up. Yeah, thank you. And and welcome Mike and Leah. Pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for being on. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and uh, Mike, I know you a little bit. Uh, Leah, this is the first time meeting you. Um, but we really look forward to just spending a few minutes talking about your 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 relationship, your marriage, your family, um, and experiences that you have. Um, we're we're this is part of a, a two part series on uh, interracial couples, and essentially, this is very important to me. I, I just want to know what people's lives are like from their perspective, and and I think that uh, just the point of time that we're in. In the U.S., it's, it is an important time to to hear from other people's uh, perspective. Yeah, so hearing about other people's experience, it's just a really important time to listen to others. And so, again, thanks for being here, and I look forward to just talking with you about your relationship. I'd first love to just have you guys, uh, since this is audio, not video, describe your family to our listeners. Um, well, I am a white American male. Um, Leah is a black female from the island of Barbados. Um, so I'll let Leah describe how she, you know, identifies herself in that regard. We have three children. Um, Noah's 12, Emma's nine, Grace is four. Um, and they're, they're biracial or really multiracial. Uh, Leah, I don't know if you want to talk about your background a little bit. Well, yeah, I'm, so as Mike said, I was born and raised in Barbados, um, it's a Caribbean island. And, um, but my mom is Guyanese, so from Guyana, which is in South America, and my dad is Barbadian. On my mom's side, though, her mother was um, East Indian and Welsh and Black, and my grandfather, her father is Portuguese. So I'm a little bit mixed up, but visually I'm black. So I just consider myself black. Um, but growing up, I didn't have to identify one way or another. So yeah. Is, Barb is Barbados predominantly uh, black? It is predominantly black. However, um, a lot of people are mixed with white, black. Indian, Portuguese, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of mixture in the island itself, mm. but yeah, there are more people darker complected than lighter complected. Ge geographically, is Barbados uh, closer to South America? Is it yes. in the less, lesser Antilles? Yes. So it's the most southeasterly island. It's the, so the closest land mass to bar the east of Barbados is Africa. Little fun fact for you there. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. But so it's literally coast. right off the coast of Guyana, right? It's like right there. It's like practically Guyana or Venezuela, um, right? It's really close. No, that's Trinidad. So Trinidad is more right off the coast of South America. 
and we are north east of Trinidad. Yeah. You mentioned your parents and and your parents being of different um, ethnicities or or from different countries. Mm -hmm. How did they meet? They met in England. So my dad, oh dear, a little fun history fact. So my grandfather was a professional cricketer. He played for the West Indies, which is really big in the Caribbean. And, um, but my dad was born in Barbados, but he grew up in England because my grandfather was a cricketer and cricket's really big in England. Professional cricketing is even bigger. And so um, my dad grew up in England and um, my mom went to England from Guyana to do nursing. And so they met in England via my aunt, my uncle's wife. <laughs> yeah. So my uncle's wife and my mother were childhood friends in Guyana. And she was with my uncle and she introduced my mom to my dad. Oh, wow. International. They are an international family. Yes, we are an international crew, without a doubt. That's yes. right. And and athletic. I I um yeah, I know that you're not only the uh Tulane head swimming and diving coach, but that you yourself were a phenomenal uh swimmer, I believe. Can you say yes. something about that? Yeah, so I represented Barbados internationally. I competed in two Olympics, ninety six and two thousand. So 96 was in Atlanta, 2000 was in Sydney. Um, so I, I, re I represented Barbados quite a bit internationally. And then I swam at the University of Florida. That's what, what got me to the United States in the first place. Um, I was on athletic scholarship at Florida. So. Your collegiate career brought you from Barbados yes. to, to, the, to the state. So your first... Yes. Uh, experience, I guess, of living in the States was as a uh, young woman. As a college student, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yeah. I believe that that's where you guys met. Can you, you want to talk about that? How did you guys meet? So we met in grad school. So after I finished my undergrad, uh, we started um, grad school in sport and exercise psychology. We had the same academic advisor and um, that's how we initially met so we met in grad school never saw him ever during undergrad but <laughs> i guess we yeah, we, were, we didn't we weren't in the same crowd <laughs> right we, we were both at florida undergrad at the same time um, but we didn't meet till grad school and like she said our we had the same academic advisor uh, dr jacoby and i think lee had started a semester before me and so she already had like a research project underway and this was like 2004. So her project involved stress and coping with swimmers who were training for that year's Olympics. And as the new guy, my job was to transcribe all of her interviews that she was doing with her participants. Ah. Um, so we were part of a, like a research group together where we were kind of doing, um, Kind of analyzing the the transcriptions and kind of building off of those things to kind of uh i think i think they're i can't remember but they were sort of like before conference after conference after nc2a's and then like before trials that summer mm -hmm. uh leah interviewed um eight to ten people that were training at uf um probably still pretty good data i don't know if you've ever you ever done, it, done anything with that but um it was pretty interesting stuff yeah I don't even know where that is. <laughs> so you, you, you all met in grad school working on a research project. So I know that that is good news to all my graduate students. There's still hope. That is an excellent <laughs> plug for going to grad school or, or being Absolutely. in grad school and doing the work of the hard work of transcribing. I have this image, mm -hmm. Mike, of you transcribing her words, thinking, man, she has beautiful grammar. I got to meet this girl. <laughs> I really know the, the accent definitely attracted me. Um, and then I would try to take out a lot of the ums and the likes and stuff like that. I, I would remove those from the transcript. I would help her out. <laughs> and so um, I, uh, uh, I'm sitting here now. You said, um, ah, now you got me saying, um, and ah, we, we transcribe some of our videos sometimes. And mm -hmm. my son helps me out from time to time. And he goes, he goes, man, I'm gonna tell you, 
Like it's so easy transcribing Matt's Matt's English, but you are a nightmare. Oh. <laughs> like I, English wasn't my first language, man. Come on, <laughs> cut me some slack. <laughs> So, so more about uh, you guys' relationship. Now, we, we understand that you met in grad school. How did it progress from there? Well, we went through like a time period, like, so that sort of um, January uh, through the summertime, we were sort of meeting as part of the research group. I think Leah went to the Athens Olympics as a spectator. Um, she was dating someone else at the time. Um, and I think I, I was in a relationship with sort of off and on. Um, and that was also a really tough year for Leah personally, and I'll let her maybe talk about that. We sort of kind of fell out of touch that fall of 2004 and then sort of met up again in January of 2005, but I'll let Leah talk about that year was a really difficult year for her personally, but it sort of set the stage for us in our beginning of our relationship. Yeah. Like, so as he described, we started in January 2004, but I honestly, I barely remember that. But um, he, we, um, so as he said, I was dating someone. And so our interaction, I would say that's when we met, but that's not really when we built a re relationship or a friendship or anything like that. It was just an interaction, really. Um, and but in 2004, February of 2004, my dad passed away. And then six weeks later, after that, on um, Easter Sunday, my mom got in a really bad car accident. And that's like what I would consider she passed away because mm. who I knew as who she was. Mm. We were very close. Um, someone would probably describe us as best friends. And so who I knew and remembered and loved as her died at that time because she was on life support for two years. Um, she couldn't talk. She um, had to relearn the simple, most basic things to do. Um, so it was a really stressful time for me during that period of time. That's probably yeah. why I barely remember interacting with Mike as much as I did. Um, and then, yes, I did go and I watched Olympics with my then boyfriend at the time. But then a few men, few months after my mom passed away, he broke up with me. So I had like loss after loss after loss. And, and if anybody knows how I am, um, slightly to a detriment is that I, I kind of try to do things on my own and I push through and push through. So after my dad passed away, after two weeks, I believed very incorrectly that I should have gotten over it. So I started back life. I, I kind of just went back with whatever I was doing. I was in grad school, of course. Um, but then when my mom got in the car accident, it was like I dug a little deeper hole. And again, after two weeks, I thought I should be back to normal. And mm. and then when the guy eventually broke up with me, I like just nosedive in terms of a mental health perspective. And um, so by the time, the thing too was that I was in the process of getting my green card. And so it was that period of time where it was okay for me to stay in the country, but if I left the country, I wouldn't have been able to get back in. So yeah. I couldn't go home with and be with my sister and my brother or visit my mom for Thanksgiving or for Christmas. And so during that time, I kind of went into a very deep depression and it was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And mainly it, it looking back at it, it was mainly because I didn't grieve. I didn't allow myself to grieve. Um, but how it sets the stage for meeting up with Mike, um, when I finally started back school in January of 2005, and I came back to school, I happened to be in my office because I was a GA at the time, and it was down the hall from our advisor, and Mike was passed by my office looking for our advisor. And you know, I hadn't really been around, so he stopped to see how I was doing. And that kind of, that definitely started our relationship in the sense that I felt very easy telling him what had gone on, what, what I had, you know, my mental health issues at the time. Um, he was very easy to talk with. Uh, so that is when our, I would say our relationship definitely 
started um, and was initiated because because prior to that, any interaction I do remember having of him, my immediate assumption was he's just a white fraternity guy and just a snob. That was my like initial right off the bat Nailed assumption it. of what he was. So I immediately went to, I don't like this kid. He's just a white spoiled brat guy from a fraternity. And so <laughs> that's how everything started. But then when I had, had that discussion with him, I realized that he was not a snobby guy at all. But then, so fast forward now, I'm still January, 2005. Now I'm in a position where I need to collect information for my research project. And I was doing my project on wheelchair users, um, specifically uh, wheelchair users that were in the sports. And so there was a wheelchair basketball tournament being held in Birmingham. And my, my advisor knew the guy at UAB that was kind of running it. And so we had worked out that I would stay with his grad student up there. And I think we had a class together. And I think I just was sort of asked the room, does anyone want to drive up to Birmingham this weekend? Because it's a, like a nine hour drive from Gainesville. And Leah was like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. And so, you know, we had a lot of time on the road in the car to really kind of get to know each other. It was like a super long extended first date, so to speak. Um, you really get to know people when you're driving with them, I found. So, yeah. Yeah. Road trip, road trip, love. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it starts. Yeah. And, and wow, those are fascinating stories. And thank you for sharing them with us. Um, when did you, when did you uh, realize that you were attracted to each other? Was it on the road trip? Was it before that? Was it after that? Was, when did, it sounds like there was a feeling Leah from you, particularly of feeling um, listened to and heard and that in and of itself was attractive on some level, but on this other level of, of how we look, um, when did you realize that you were attracted to each other? I think for me, um, he was always cute, I guess, for me. Like I like I from, <laughs> from a physical, Still is. I never thought, oh, this guy is ugly. That's, that's yeah. just definitely never been in my thought process at all. Um, Great to hear. <laughs> I think that the biggest attraction came now um, you guys mentioned about faith. So during this whole process, my faith was, was growing significantly. You know, when you're in the depth of depression, like there's just something about building your relationship with God at that point. And so that specific day that I saw Mike, like I distinctly remember parking my car and praying, God, I'm trying, I am not going to control anymore. Like, whatever you have for this day for me, I'm going to take it and go with it. And so I, I remember distinctly having that conversation with God. And, and so I think for me, after that first conversation with Mike, I, I, you know, after he went and he met with, with our advisor, the next day, I remember thinking, Ooh, I wonder if I'm going to bump into Mike again. And so and I happened to him, he that was happened to be sitting on a bench in a random place, like I was walking by. So I think that was um, an initial attraction, like you said, Matt, of being able to feel comfortable communicating with someone and not feeling judged and not feeling like, oh, wow, you're an idiot for saying that. Like I felt very comfortable in terms of being myself. Um, but definitely on the road trip, being able to learn about someone in a car, there was nowhere for me to go. Like, was he gonna drop me off at the side of the road? No. So it was, um, I think definitely by the end of that road trip was a really great, um, I felt very comfortable, even more comfortable with him and even more attracted to yeah. him. Uh, so, yeah, that's that for me. It was at the end of the road trip. Mike, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I I think I was I definitely know I was attracted to Leo, you know, physically January, like during that road trip. But I I distinctly remember in like February, either February or March, University of Florida was actually hosting the SEC swimming championships that that spring, 
And since Leah was, you know, still part of the program and kind of hanging out, like a part of all that, she was one of those people that would kind of walk the finalists out to the pool, like holding up the sign or whatever. And someone next to me made the comment about the way that she walked. Like she had this like really like, like model, like posture and, and the way she moved was very, and I was like, damn, you're right. And that, I, I think that sort of like kind of ignited more of that fire in me, I guess. Her and I was walk. Like, I hadn't seen it before, but I definitely see it now, you know? So, um, yeah. I think that's funny, Mike, how like sometimes, cause this, this was kind of the case with my wife, like other people will, will, will tell you like, no, you like her. I'm like, really? I, you're right. I do. <laughs> and sometimes we, we can't get out of our own way. Huh? Yeah. H- had either of you guys, uh, dated interracially before? I had. Yeah. Well, both of us had. I think that was another attraction for me was that I, you know, me moving to the States, my, my dad did not want me to move to the States, much less Gainesville, Florida, because he had heard such horrible experiences from a race racism standpoint. Hmm. And um, so that was kind of in the back of my mind. And so, as I said, my immediate hmm. judgment of Mike was fraternity boy, like, probably looks down at black girls like I had this stereotype in my head and and so it was a surprise to me when he had told me that he had had a black girlfriend I was like "Eh, really like I was genuinely surprised because that was at the back of my mind like what would his parents think what would his friends think like what is like it's just this definitely something that came up in my my brain but yes I had dated someone who was white before you, uh, I've been all over the world, and in some parts of the world, skin color means very little, and in some parts of the world, skin color means a lot. And in mm-hmm. in the you know, skin is very sh- shallow; it's very narrow; <laughs> it's not very thick. And yet, in the U.S., we assign so much meaning to it. Um, and so, as you were all starting to date. Did you hear some of that meaning or did you receive some messages from your community or from your family about your relationship? I will say, you know, being American, I think definitely, you know, race is a bigger deal in America. Um, More importance is is placed on it. And it was a concern I had internally um, of like, how will my family accept her? Um, And I was really surprised and maybe I shouldn't have been. My my family was, I, I thought, very accepting of her. Uh, the first person she met was my great aunt who lives in Orlando, in Van Joy. And I think she made a really good impression on Ann Joy. Ann Joy is my grandma's youngest sister. And I think that that sort of paved the way. Because, you know, when I first brought her down to meet the rest of my family, it was like open arms, you know. So I, I don't know if that was your experience of it, Leah, but I certainly was pleasantly surprised and, um, you know, very happy that, that my family really, I think, accepted her. Yeah, I definitely felt accepted from the beginning. Like I had, yeah, without a doubt, I didn't have any issues or anything. Um, and then I don't think, I mean, unfortunately, Mike never met my dad. And, you know, and who he met as my mother is not who my friends know as my mother, unfortunately. Um, And by the time we got down to Barbados, my mother actually had had a stroke and she lost her sight. So I don't, you know, she didn't, (laughs) couldn't see him either. And, and my sisters, like from my perspective, seemed to love him right off the bat. Um, so I, and again, my sister lives in Barbados. My brother lives in England. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't think there was any problems with him. I think with my sister, her, her biggest thing is, does he, does he treat her? Does she treat, does he treat you right? Like that's her, that was her thing. Um, if you ask her, she would say that she always thought I would marry a white man, but that's another's story altogether. (laughs) (laughs) What 
I remember as a kid receiving some bad advice, I would say, about interracial relationships. I just remember hearing things that were buried in or couched in prejudice or buried in racism uh, about interracial relationships. I, I remember somebody around me saying something like, it, you'll just have a hard time getting along together. Your, your, fa your cultures are different. Your families will have a hard time getting along together. I remember hearing that from somewhere. And I also remember hearing from somewhere else, it's similar to what your sister said. It doesn't matter as long as you're, you love each other or you care about each other or you're pulling in the same direction or you're um, treating each other well or you have the same vision or goals for life. So I remember hearing some varied advice uh, from my community. Do you remember some, some advice maybe when you were younger prior to meeting each other, maybe as kids, maybe as college students, uh, that your, your experience um, proved wrong? I don't know if I can remember any like specific advice, but it was certainly something that was internalized in me, which is why I think I expected a different response from my family. Not, my family never said anything explicitly like, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. I think it was just sort of, maybe it was a cultural thing, I don't know. There, there was sort of like this idea of, if it's too different, it, it's not going to work out. There's too many things to overcome, too many, you know, um, mm. too many issues to deal with. Uh, so why put yourself through that? It's sort of, I guess, what I had internalized in my mind. Um, uh, for, um, for me, I would say it was just, as I mentioned earlier, my dad, you know, he had heard horror stories because we had some close family friends who had... Uh, who went to school, like their kids went to the University of Florida and prior to me, and they had a horrible experience from a racial perspective. And um, they were actually my godparents' children. And so my dad was terrified to send me. He was scared about how I would be treated. You know, he kept on explaining, it's not the same as Barbados. It's not the same as Barbados. So you have to be careful. Sometimes you're not going to be treated the same way. Uh, and so, and keep in mind, these family friends were very light skinned. They were light skinned. And so they're, you know, Matt, you asked earlier about um, skin color. And in Barbados, I would say if there's any prejudice, I mean, I'm sure there's some level of racial prejudice in Barbados, but I just never experienced it. And, um, and, but I would say there's, there may be a prejudice from a classism perspective. And, and so my family friends are, you know, they were from middle, upper class, light skinned, um, but they didn't look white. So when they had gone to school in, in Gainesville, the white people didn't want to have anything to do with them because they didn't look white, white enough. And the black people didn't really want anything to do with them because they didn't look black enough. And so I think that was really difficult for them, especially coming from somewhere where they were accepted wherever they went. And it was not based on skin color. You know, nothing was based off, mm. off of that. So I think for me at the back of my mind, it wasn't a matter of, um, necessarily a relationship will work out but it was a protection of the possibility maybe that you may be looked at differently because of your skin color so i think that's why my assumption about mike was there was to protect me and to assume hey that's how his parents would react therefore he wouldn't want to have anything to do with me kind of thing yeah, yeah i mean as you're as you're portraying your, your dad's advice, that's how it sounds. It sounds protective. It sounds like, uh, you know, trying to protect you from future harm in some way. Yeah. Based on information that he had received about the U S. Yes. I want to transition if it's okay to you guys as parents. Now I know that you have, you mentioned that you have children. I know that you have children. And so there, I want to talk a, a little bit about, being a, a multiracial family and having um, multiracial kids and, and what that experience has been like. Um, just before we jump into that, 
Um, have there been some like humorous ways that growing up in different cultures, different places has, has shown up in your marriage? <laughs> I would say accent wide. Mike loves to do accents. He loves to do accents. And the Barbadian accent is probably one of the most difficult to mimic out of all the Caribbean accents, I would argue it's one of the most difficult to mimic, but he does it very well. And oh. so, but I, my accent becomes stronger when I'm talking to my sister or when I'm in Barbados, um, like he knows who I'm talking to on the phone based on how strong my accent comes out or if I'm talking to my sister. Um, but it's, it's, I get a good kick of when we're in Barbados and he tries to talk Bajan. He looks, sounds like a Bajan white. It's really funny. That's Bajan. what we call pe white people in Barbados. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is Bajan? Could you, Mike, could, is you, Bajan? Uh, could you pretend Bajan, that we're in Barbados? Yes. Could you pretend that we're in Barbados, Mike? Is that no? <laughs> it, it takes it takes at least a couple days of submersion before it comes out. It comes out naturally. It just happens. Yeah. I don't even try. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is true. Because sometimes I look at him and I'm like, "Why are you talking like that?" <laughs> I think I think I think I use as my my sort of like like kind of jump off point is. The word car, you say kiar, and I think if I if I start with kiar, then I can kind of go into it from there. But I'm not so, going to do that now. <laughs> Leah, is it is it more of an accent or is it more of a dialect? Because I know a lot of the islands have have dialects that it's you're kind of throwing in other words that are not necessarily. Um, both, both, but it um, but it starts definitely with the accent. Yeah. yeah, it's very similar to a um. Uh, a country British person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a well, very, it's interesting. I mean, going off of accents, like there's, there's certain words that Leah says, I give her a hard time about. Um, and like they're, they're, they're taught certain things like bear, bear, and bear. So bear, the animal, um, bear, like, you know, you're showing something and then bear the drink, otherwise known as beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm always like, <laughs> That's always a good one. Um, there's other words she yeah. says that I just get a kick out of. I like to tease her about when I hear it. But... He makes fun of me when I say taco. Taco, yeah. yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, Leah. Having, having a, a Cuban family, I get it. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> kind of going back now to kids, um, what were, you know, just when, when parents decide to have kids or, or for parents who, who get to decide to have kids, um, generally, that's a pretty thoughtful decision. Um, what were some of the thoughts and discussions for you guys around having kids? Um, I, well, I'll start that off with, with remembering what, you know, we got married in Barbados and the minister there that was doing the officiating, we had to meet with him a couple times beforehand. And he's the one who brought this up. I, I think maybe we had thought about it, but we kind of maybe brushed it off. But he was like, you know, I, we were living in South Carolina at the time. And... Um, you know, I, he said something in the fact of, you know, do people in America, is it okay to have, you know, multiracial kids? And I was like, yeah, sure. I've seen, you know, I've seen a bunch of kids that are multiracial. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, I'm not sure if we, I'm not sure if we really thought about it a lot beforehand of like what kind of impact it'll be. Um, and I know that, you know, due to recent events, I've kind of have sort of felt like, you know, we brought them into a world that maybe, you know, wasn't ready for it or, or like what kind of position do we put them in inadvertently, you know? Um, mm. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I honestly, I hadn't even thought of it from the perspective of race with having kids. Mm. Um, I just wanted kids. <laughs> and um, so I hadn't really thought about it. I do remember Again, when I first moved here, being very confused about why, because I would see a number of different videos of interracial kids being very upset um, about being interracial and not knowing what their identity was. And, and for me, that was very confusing because, again, I didn't grow up in that person. I didn't grow up as race being part of my identity. Like, I, I just... That just wasn't what I was taught. Um, my mother just taught me to be strong in my beliefs, trust in God, 
um, you know, be a strong, like, you know, she always told me to be a strong woman, not a strong black woman. Like it was just mm -hmm. always, you know, it, that was a part of my identity. So I never really understood when I would see videos of, of kids being so upset about those feelings of not knowing where they fit, how they fit in. And, and, but now fast forward to today, I'm getting a better grasp of it for sure. So at the time of having kids, I definitely did not think of it from the perspective of, um, you know, what they would have to endure as a biracial child or person in this country. Yeah. And I think I would just add to that. Like, I think the other thing that, that is maybe harder for our kids specifically is that, you know, like Leah talked about, her parents have both passed away. And so they get a lot of time and a lot of, you know, my, my parents are wonderful because they get to spend a lot of time with them. Um, but I do think there is some missing piece to their upbringing of like, you know, other strong role models that are black and that are around them more. Like, I think, you know, obviously Leah's sister is a great role model for them. She's a doctor. She does. She's really accomplished, but they don't get to see her that much. Same with, with their uncle. You know, he lives in England, so they don't get to see him that much. I think that harms them in a way of not being able to connect with that part of their identity. Um, I remember Noah, when he was like four or five, they were, it was like Black History Month. They were talking about Rosa Parks. And out of the conversation, I realized he did not see himself as black. He saw himself as white. He was probably the only person to see himself that way because in America, if you're even slightly have any pigmentation, you're considered black. Um, and so it struck me then that like, the identity he had was sort of really based on how we were bringing him up and who he was around. Mm. Yeah, I would say that's that's. So I would say that's that is that has been a tough tough realization. So Noah's our oldest; he's twelve, um, and then our nine year old and four year old are girls, and that has been it's been tough for me to. And I think it's been tough for him because he's had to have those communications and those those conversations with me in particular in terms of me having to explain to him, okay, you're you're gonna have to work that much harder to get the same thing as your white con counterparts. And Noah's a kid who he always finds the need, he has to explain himself. If he thinks he is put in an unfair situation, he has to explain and explain and and it's really hard for me to, because I have to tell him, if you are with a policeman or if you are with anyone of authority, you've got to curb that. You can't just expect people to listen to you because that's not immediately going to happen. And it's, mm. and it's unfair, I think, that I have to explain that to him and I have to bring that into his radar. But that's the reality of the situation. And that's a big fear of mine of him getting in trouble because of his mouth, because of him trying to stand up for himself. So there's there's a big balance of, okay, you're gonna you have to learn to keep your mouth shut when it's time to keep your mouth shut, even if you think it's unfair. And so he he's that's something that he is has to learn continually. And because he doesn't have that family around him constantly, and then on top of the fact that I wasn't I didn't grow up in this culture. So I, I think I'm a little behind in being able to teach him that because I haven't had that experience through childhood. And I think mm -hmm. childhood is a big time where you learn the trials and errors of what, whether or not it happens to you or whether or not you observe it from other people. And so I didn't have that growing up. And so trying to protect him and prepare him for it, it scares me because I, I don't have that experience to give. I can only you know, give him off of just what I hear, or what I observe. So, yeah, Mike, do you? Uh, how have you parented Noah through through that particular aspect of like your skin could get you in trouble in a different way than other people that you're around? How, do, how have you, as a, as the the white parent and father, how have you parented him through that? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, I don't think I've done as, as good of a job as, as, as needed, um, to answer bluntly. Um, you know, I, I certainly feel a lot of guilt around that, like a lot of like, it shouldn't be this way. 
and it kind of sucks kind of explain to your child that like because of because of the way you look which had you had nothing to do with you didn't ask to be here because of what your mother and i decided you're here and now you have to deal with this and by the way i don't have to deal with it at all or not nearly at the same level that you do it, it's, it's it's been hard for me to have that discussion because of my own sort of internal feelings um but you know I think one thing that I have going for me is, you know, the counseling program I went to, and I'm sure all counseling programs have this, but, you know, there's, there's like a multicultural class that you take and you, and you kind of learn some of these things. And I'm not saying one class is going to solve all of my issues, but it certainly opened my eyes to a lot of things um, to make me more aware of, of certain things. Um, like we talked about small things like, um, you know, kids of color not having like superheroes they can point to easily and say, that's a superhero I can identify with. I remember asking friends on Facebook, guys, my son just asked me, why are there no brown heroes? And, and I had some people then respond like, well, there's these and these and these, but they're all like more of the minor character. They're not like the major players that, that you know about. It seems kind of minor, but it's one of those things of like, you know, who can these kids like really kind of identify with and, and use as like a, you know, a touchstone of, oh, I can be like that, or this is possible for me. That's an interesting, that's an interesting point. I've got a friend, uh, Jesse Burr Jr., and he writes children's books. And like his focus is making the main characters black or Hispanic characters so that kids are, who are black or Hispanic can identify with, with the main character because you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. I even remember, if you remember when... Um, the remake of Annie came out um, and Annie was mm -hmm. a black girl. That was, that was controversial. Like how could you change Annie? <laughs> we can always improve. I, I mentioned Mike, I'm interested in this is kind of, I guess this can tie into parenting and Matt, if I change the subject too much, forgive me. Um, you, you're the white guy. You married a black girl. You have um, biracial kids in America. You know, they're, they're, you know, black uh, I'm curious how people interact with you as the white guy who's got a black family. Do they see you as someone who gets it, it being racism more than others? Or is that, I'm just curious how people interact with you. Yeah. You know, I think, I think sometimes people do kind of extend that sort of like, Oh, he must have an understanding. Um, I've never had anyone like say explicitly to me one way or the other, whether they think, I get it or I, they think I don't get it. Um, I don't think people are comfortable having that kind of frank outward discussion. Um, I, you know, I, I think I, a long time ago, I quit like paying attention to people's reactions. Like when I would, this is my son, Noah, you know, this is my daughter, Emma, like, cause I think you perceiving some of those things before of like, Oh, they kind of give you like a sideways glance or like, is this guy, is, are these his adopted kids? Are these really his, you know what I mean? Um, I think I've kind of come, I have sort of a piece about that now where I don't let that bother me. Um, I do think that, that sometimes people assume that because someone is with someone of another race, that that means that they're like, they're woke or they're, they're, they understand it all. And I think that's a really dangerous assumption because there's not everyone not everyone has the same motivations. Not everyone has the same experiences. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone's relationship is exactly the same. Um, so it, it takes work, I think. And it's work that I'm still trying to do of making myself more educated about race issues, especially race issues in this country. Um, like right now, Leah, is she was reading the book, Me, Me and White Supremacy. And I'm reading that not as quickly as Leah would maybe like me to, but I'm I'm trying to do that to, to improve, you know, and see it, how can this make me a, a better parent, you know, for my kids. Yeah, it was, um, it, it's, it was interesting. I was thinking about, I was thinking about, um, uh, Leah being a coach, right? She's an Olympian. When you, when you were in the Olympics, Leah, did you have a coach? Oh yeah. You yeah. had someone, even though you're a, 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 a world-class athlete, there was someone who was still pointing out, criticizing, if you will. Yeah. your technique and what you weren't doing right. And I was thinking about that in the context of this race conversation that even though we quote unquote get it, even though we're culturally different, um, we still need people to kind of speak to us and to keep us in check. I had an experience recently. I'm, I'm Hispanic, right? My family came from Cuba. 
yeah, I found out that I had been saying things that was offensive to a, to a Hispanic friend of mine. And when he shared it with me, it wrecked me. I'm like, oh my God, I had no clue. I had no clue that I was putting you in that position. Um, so I do think it's something I appreciate how you say it. It's, it's learning. We have to engage it. I heard someone say recently that right now, kind of where we are, we have to respond to the moment, but we have to prepare for the marathon. That race, yeah, w- whether we like it or not, um, race in America is something that's it's real and we have to deal with it. There, there is so much hurt that um, unfortunately it's an issue that, that has to be dealt with. We can't just just overlook it and not deal with it. And even for myself, I mean, I, I wasn't grew, I didn't grow up in this culture. So even for myself, I have to, you know, the black Caribbean Barbadian culture is completely different to the black American African American culture. It's, they're two different things. And so uh, for me, I still feel like I have to be, I have to educate myself um, and learn. And that's, one of the main reasons I was reading the book Mike just referred to because, you know, I, I still need to learn. I need to learn for the kids. Um, you know, it was a surprise to me the other day. I asked Noah if he felt like he was caught in the middle. And to my surprise, he said, yes, I do. And I was like, I had to hide my shock from him. And, and I, I, I had to explain to him that it's not black versus white. It's just understanding that you are to be respected. You are to be respectful. And it's not you have to be on one side of the family versus the other side of the family. You just need to understand and be educated. And I think your my goal for you and my hope for you as I was talking to him was that he become more educated on both sides of the coin. But I, I was actually very surprised that he, I was expecting him to be like, no, I'm fine, which is what my nine-year-old would say. But he, I think, is a little bit more aware. And he just point blank said, yes, I felt like I was in the middle. So that was something I had to talk through with him. I, ha- I have a different question, but related to this part of the discussion, and, and it relates to colorism in that, skin shades are are given different meanings in different parts of the world and in 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 the US in the south in new orleans skin shade has also been part of the dialogue and so uh this often comes up with sibling groups in multiracial families is that they're not all exactly the same shade and so has that come up for your kids and i know that they're young and it sounds like they're starting to become aware of the meanings that are tied to different skin colors. But is has skin shade come up as part of the discussion for your family? Not yet, no. I think right now the main discussion about race has mainly been with Noah because he's the eldest. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the girls, um, not so much. You know, I pose Grace, who's four, we don't, she's in her own little world, so just mm-hmm. trying to keep her as innocent as long as possible. Um, but Emma, I, who's the nine year old, you know, I just keep it, I've just kept it very basic in asking her, do you have any questions for any, any race questions or any topic? And she's usually like, no, there's no question. So in terms of colorism, no, that hasn't come up as a conversation just yet. Um, I think, I don't think explicitly, but I think sort of, we've, we've made comments like, you know, not all of our kids are the same. I mean, they're pretty close, but, you know, uh, I think Emma's probably has the darkest complexion. Noah's probably not as dark and, and Grace probably the lightest complexion. They all have different hair texture, you know, which, you know, whenever Leah's doing their hair, it's much more painful for Grace because the way her texture is. Um, and so I think that's something maybe we need to follow up with them about because it might be something that they're kind of internalizing that we're not aware of yet. Like, cause it's, like I said, there's been comments made, but we sort of make it a comment of like, it doesn't matter what shade you are. Like we think you're all beautiful the way, the way you are, but that can still be taken a different way. So I, I, I um, yeah, I think it's something we just have to keep, keep an eye on. Um, 
and kind of keep checking in with them about. Because I wouldn't want them to think that we're like preferential towards one child or another based on that. Sure. It's so interesting to see how kids learn this stuff. Uh, one of my one of my best friends, a neighbor of mine, um, is black, and I interact with his son, who's seven. Um, he calls me uncle, and and he doesn't he doesn't see himself necessarily as as black, um, even though his 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 entire family's black. It's just it's just so interesting how when you get to know someone at a deeper level, and you take the time to understand each other, and you relate to each other beyond. Um, the, the, the color of the skin and as humans, how, how it doesn't even matter. Uh, but yet they learn this stuff from the culture and the society and, and they have to deal with it. And it's, um, it's, it's so devious. Yeah. I always say that, and, and I probably read this somewhere, but I always say that kids notice skin color. Kids notice variations in skin color. Kids just don't have any way to, to assign value to that one way or the other until culture kind of bombards them with messages about better or worse or safer or danger, more dangerous or more valuable or less valuable. And then they start, kids start to form this mental model where they're, 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 um, you know, connecting various skin shades with various values. And that's such a tragedy. I mean, diversity and, and variation and variegation, if you will, is beautiful, and yet our culture uh, corrupts that message with, with like value, and mm-hmm. and I think we have to continually wrestle against that. One, one, uh, one, one of my kids when they were younger was interacting with a black teacher, and they were talking about skin color, and the black teacher told my son that. It doesn't matter what color the hand is, as long as it's a helping hand. And I, I think that we need to do a better job of, of identifying who are the safe, secure helpers out there and who are the threats and not conflate that with skin color at all. Right. That's the, that's the, that's the sin of slavery. That's what we're paying for today because skin color was such a convenient way to mark a group of people. And that's what, that w- that's what was so um, diabolical about the American um, system of slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we're still seeing the impact today. And, and that, that's, yeah. the, that's the injustice that's so kind of behind the current that so many people don't get. Um, it's really hard to understand. Well, people, you know, black people have the same opportunities today. Yeah. But there's this, there's this, there's this, this behind the scenes that, uh, like Matt was saying that value is assigned to skin color and mm-hmm. it's just, it's just carryover. Um, and, 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 and like the, the statement I heard, you know, we're responding to a moment, but we have to prepare for the marathon. And I think it starts with, you know, we're, we're all about talking about relationships. It's, taking time to listen to people different than ourselves racially, culturally, demographically, as we start to realize that, um, we're not that different. We're not that different. I think that that's one of the, one of the great things with, with Mike and, and it was, I think the counseling program that he, he deciding to be a therapist and go through the counseling program that he did was one of the best things for a marriage because it allowed him to be open and willing to listen to another perspective, specifically my perspective with things, you know, whether it is, um, you know, for a while I was really hard on Noah about school. I mean, I was like, you need to get all A's, you need to do really well. And Mike was getting frustrated with me because he didn't want Noah to equate him doing well in school with how much we loved him. And I had to explain to Mike that the reason why I was so hard on Noah was because he has to work harder to get the same things that Mike may have done that was very easy. He could just get away with. And I think it was a good thing because Mike then took that in and was like, I didn't even think of that. 
And so, and he asked me, can you make sure to explain that to Noah so that Noah didn't feel like I was just, my love was based on his thing of school. When again, it was back to just protecting him of getting that strong work ethic in him and understanding he just can't, just because he's a smart kid, he can't just cruise through school. He has to work hard, extra hard to get to where he has to be because I had to work extra hard to be recognized to accomplish, to get to where I was at. That's yeah. also, a, that's also a, a, a very typical mentality of the immigrant, right? Like I'm, I'm right. coming here and I have to work harder than everyone else. Yes, uh, yeah. correct. As we, as we start to wrap up, I'd like to get um, a few final thoughts from you guys, Leah and Mike. Um, we've, we've talked about a number of issues. Toward the, toward the end there, we started to talk about uh, your your family's relationship with society and culture and and the the impacts of all of that. So I just want to give you guys an opportunity. Uh, maybe it's something we haven't asked yet, but what would you like our listeners to to take away from this or to remember about your experience? I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. I, I think that what I want people to get away from this is. Um, you know, everyone's experience is different. Um, so there might be maybe interracial couples out there listening to this that like, well, my parents didn't act that way or my, you know, my family wasn't that accepting. Um, everyone is different uh, in, in how the relationship goes. But I think as long as you're willing to work at it, and this goes with any relationship really, you know, as long as you're willing to put in the work and, you know, talk to your partner, what is it that is important? For me to know about you or about us, what what do we need to, to figure out? For a long time, we 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 didn't do that. Lee and I were just kind of sailing along in our own separate you know paths, and I think that it really took us reaching out to each other more to help kind of build that up. Yeah, I piggyback along um, on that and that communication. Communication is key, but not only expressing what you're thinking and feeling, but also being willing to hear and listen to the other person without trying to change that person's mind. So like accepting what they're saying as their truth, not necessarily your truth, but their truth. And, um, and, and not assuming things too. So there, there's another side of that too, is not assuming what your partner is saying, but actually saying, you know, expressing, hey, this is how I interpreted this. Is that right or wrong? And that's e way easier said than done because emotion is all mixed up into that. Um, but I think the, the big thing is communication and not assuming the person knows what you're thinking or knows what your perspective is. But, you know, the, on the receiving end, you got to be willing to hear it and not try to try to fix it or try, definitely don't try to fix it, but just hear it and take it in. If I could just add one more thing, I think for, for the white folks out there of like, don't be defensive about things that get brought up related to race. Like I know that a lot of people get really reactive when they're called racist or that was racist or people like really jump off the deep end on that. I think being open to like, Hey, you know, white people did some really messed up stuff. And I didn't do those things, but it doesn't mean that that I can't help change things now. Um, I don't have to I don't have to wilt under the weight of the past, but I have to recognize that it happened, and I have to recognize I have a place in making it better. Yeah, I gotta imagine too, as 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 a guy with white skin, it's when you know, I shared an experience where I offended a friend. It was, oh my gosh, tell me what I did. What did I say? What was what was hurtful? Because like I I'm. I'm ignorant and I, and I need to, I need to know so I don't do it again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like approaching it with, with humility right. as opposed to, I wasn't alive 250. <laughs> I didn't own anybody. Like that's not the right way to, 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 yeah. to deal with, with emotions. Yeah. Man, like I feel like we could keep talking for two more hours or three more hours because I have no tear about swimming and coaching and, <laughs> And my favorite rum from Barbados <laughs> that we haven't even gotten to yet, um, but this has been this has been really um, 
this has been really good. This has been great. I, I appreciate y'all being so open just to share uh, your experience and maybe we'll have to, to get y'all back out. I do want to, I do want to put a plug in really quick for Dr. Matt Morris and associates. So Dr. Matt is Dr. Matt and Mike are fantastic counselors as we're dealing with really difficult times in our country, uh, different difficult issues, racial issues, marital issues. Um, their team at Dr. Matt and associates is, um, is hands down, uh, you know, I don't know many counselors, but I'm going to say they are, they are some of the best. Uh, no, but seriously, I think these are good, particularly interracial couples, right? If you're in an interracial marriage, uh, I imagine Mike would be a, a, a great person to talk to, to work through some of those issues because of his own personal experience. So, um, awesome, awesome time guys, Matt, any, any closing okay. words for us? Well, Eric, I appreciate the, the plug that was unexpected. Um, but I, I appreciate it. And, you know, our focus at our practice is strengthening relationships and building us just what we're talking about on this podcast. And Lee and Mike, I really appreciate kind of the, the ending advice you gave there and how it's so applicable to your, your marriage, but it's so applicable to us, to all of our relationships, to all of our marriages, to all of our parenting. I mean, you, you said, listen to each other. Don't listen defensively. Uh, don't assume you know what the other person's already thinking or, or believing or saying, and just how applicable that is to me, to my home, to our homes, uh, to your home and to our our country right now and i appreciate your your contribution in in building us as we say at the end of our podcast invest in your relationships thank you dr matt morris maintains an active private practice for couples and families in the greater new orleans area to learn more about his work visit drmattmorris.com Eric Garcia can be found online at plan-wisely.com. His branch office is located in New Orleans, Louisiana. The branch phone number is 504-218-5479. Securities offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through New Century Financial Group, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Insurance services offered through Garcia Financial Group, LLC. Entities listed are not affiliated.